you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm here with my co host, Nikki Sims. Hello. Coming from SoCal. 72 and sunny all the time. Yeah, it is pretty nice. <laughs> it's starting to get hot here. And we're joined today by Noah Hayden. Welcome to the show, sir. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. Noah is one of our coaches. You guys have heard him before on the podcast. Primarily, he co-hosted our Barbell Health series with Dr. Sullivan back in October of 2020. And actually, one of the reasons we brought him on, by the way, he's a coach at Barbell Logic. He is also one of our copy editors, so he does a lot of work on Written documents we put out, both external and internal, has been lots of help for us. And honestly, that probably the thing we're going to talk about today in the article that you wrote probably had a lot to do with that. My experience with you so far is that you're an excellent communicator, both spoken and written. Well, first off, you first presented this idea of a rethinking of the exercise selection criteria. You presented that in the third episode of the Barbell Health series. Right. I think I told you back at the time, it was one of the most influential programming articles I had read in a long time. It really influenced my thoughts about programming. And then also I have worked this stuff in to my lectures on programming at our seminars. And Nikki's heard that several times. And I always try to give you credit where credit is due because so much of this came out of presenting this idea on the podcast with Sully. And then we had you write an article. So there is an article on the website. I think it's called Rethinking Exercise Selection Criteria. Re-examining the exercise oh, criteria. Go. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> and so to first hear about this idea, you can go back and listen to the early thoughts there in the Barbell Health series. And then I did a series or I did an episode with Nikki, I think it's episode 348 called The Beginnings of Programming, which was a month or so after your podcast where I mm -hmm. had continued to just kind of chew on it. And as the verbal processor that I am, just sort of processed while recording and talk through sort of how we've taken what you did for the Barbell Health series and also considering a lot of the piece of this that is sort of Sully's that he's like carved out as a niche for himself is this idea of exercise as medicine. Mm -hmm. It's therapeutic. And so it was pretty heavy with that. And while that is 100% correct, I would absolutely agree I didn't want to steal Sully's thunder there. So I was trying to take the way we sort of apply exercise in general or exercise selection in general to sort of all populations. Right. And it's, this still carries over really, really well. But when we don't just consider exercise as medicine, which is still a great way to think about exercise, really this stuff still holds and still stands really well on its own two legs. So what I wanted to start with is what made you start considering rethinking the exercise selection criteria. And obviously, so that people understand that well, I'm trying to present good pod here, we will obviously go through what those things are. But before I get there, sure, <laughs> you know, in the very beginnings, which is a very good place to start, what made you start to think about like, how do we pick our exercises? And there's so many out there. What got you thinking about this thing? I'd like to say that it's pretty flattering that you think so highly of it, because I was wondering how much value veteran coaches would take from that article. Yeah. I don't feel like there's any big, complex, awesome new ideas in there. I think that it's just more of a subtle perspective shift in how we approach the 30,000 foot view of programming for clients. That was really the point of the article. And I think that I started thinking about that because yes, I work at Gray Steel with Sully and I have a lot of older clients, but you know, not everybody at Grace Deal is 85 and dealing with Parkinson's and diabetes and replaced joints. And, you know, there's a lot of average middle-aged uh, working class people, you know, but the one thing that there's not a lot of is competitive athletes. Mm. So I think that it's easy for a coach that, you know, all of us came from other professions, right? Sure. So we all got into coaching because we loved lifting and we saw the value in it. And it's our hobby. You know, it's our thing and our passion. And so we dive really deep into it. And I think it's very easy for someone like that that becomes a coach that, you know, develops all of these skills and that has a lot of value and other people will 
pay money to have access to that, it's easy to forget that all those other people might not have the same goals. They might not want to be crazy about lifting or even, you know, crazy about some other competitive sport that lifting helps like jujitsu or something, right? Yep. Some people just want to look better. They just want to lose a little weight or eat healthier or, you know, a big one is not being chronic pain all the time, which is, yeah. you know, one of those uh, criteria that I put in the article for that reason. I've had a lot of people that have come to me not caring what they look like, not caring how strong they are, not caring about changing their diet. They just don't want their back to hurt all the time. Yep. And that's all they care about. So I think that especially a newer coach that's trying to orient themselves in a different profession, that's a service profession when it comes down to it, you have to make sure that you're providing the service that your clients want and not providing the service that you want to give because you love it. Absolutely. Yep, that's right. Yeah. You know, that first point that you've made here is the reason, and a lot of this supported the talk that I had with Nikki and Mission Control about ultimately defining why we do what we do. Right. And this is where the quality of life, the improved quality of life piece came in. As you walk through all of those things that you just walked through, the practical items, some people just want to look better, don't want to have debilitating pain. Some people really do want to get stronger or put on more muscle or lift for jujitsu or for the men's basketball league or whatever. But all of those things, as the client would see it and as the client would define it, would lead to a better quality of life. And so for us, the most broad goal for everyone, regardless of what it practically looks like, is that we're trying to help people have a better quality of life. Now, for some people, and they would probably argue that it would give them a better quality of life as well, but for uber competitive athletes who are just trying to put another pound on the bar, and that's all they care about because they're a very competitive power lifter, or they're just trying to lose another half percentage of body fat because they want to get on stage and be a bodybuilder or something. So that is a different means to like what the goal is. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just one of the things that I liked about the way you defined it was that certainly at Graysteel, while not everyone is a senior citizen that trains at Graysteel, there are very, very few heavily competitive athletes. Right. And it's actually sort of similar at Barbell Logic. We definitely have competitive athletes, and we certainly encourage our general population people to compete, especially the more they have options to compete in online, like strength lifting events and whatnot. That is not the overarching goal. The overarching goal is to improve your quality of life. And so to me, that actually started to help better define what we were going to do, the hows, when we really understood the whys. And so I think in lifting and strength and conditioning, we get really good at the hows sometimes and we sort of just skip over the why and it's the most important thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said you weren't sure what veteran coaches would take out of this, but I think we take out a whole lot because when you're a newer coach, you learn like these are the templates. I yeah. will program with these templates. And the longer you coach, the more advanced your lifters get and you realize like that eh, my lifters aren't going to fit in these templates anymore. And so this was helpful because it reinforces the idea that there isn't the ideal program right. for that person. Like, I feel like we get trapped in this thought process that we need to have all the answers in the program we give. And we think there should be an ideal and there is a right answer when it's really a lot more vague than that. But there has to be some sort of framework. It's like, mm. I know we compare this to like relationships sometimes, but like templates are like the ideal Disney movie relationship where it's like, okay, that's not going to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's the opposite in the spectrum where it's just like, just do what feels good every day. And it's like, oh, well, that's not going to get you anywhere. But having this framework that you've laid out here lets you stay in the middle ground while adjusting it to become really, while it may not be perfect and ideal, it's perfect for that person at that point in time that's still going to get them to a certain goal. Yep. So I think it's very useful for veteran coaches. So Good job on that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's really important as a coach to have a true philosophical understanding of why we're programming the way we do. And I think a lot of times about sort of the way I learned math was I just sort of learned the house, right? You memorize the equations, you memorize the quadratic formula, but I never really understood the whys. I didn't have a Newtonian understanding of math or physics. And for coaches, it's a lot of times it's the same way. In the beginning, they just sort of learn the, here's the template, the vocab. here's the program, here's the vocab, do it this way. And it works okay. I think there's value in that, you know. Of course there is. Yeah. I think that when coaches first start out, you know, 
strength coaching is a really complex profession. There's a lot of different areas that you have to have a pretty in-depth functional knowledge of. And I don't know how this is for everyone else, but when I learn about anatomy or Newtonian mechanics or nutrition or even, you know, a fair bit of psychology to be able to understand, you know, what people's motivations are and all of that, you kind of go down rabbit holes with these things. You kind of go deep on one little subject and it's easy, like I was saying, to not come up for air and go back up and look at the whole forest and see like, okay, how does this new information fit into the complete approach? Yes. You know, the total approach to the profession. I don't know. Maybe sometimes you need a reminder of that. Well, and it makes perfect sense that, you know, my kids, we do classical education and they do this trivium of learning, right? They start with the less deep levels of knowledge and they slowly get deeper and deeper. So they have this sort of stages of like the grammar stage, the logic stage, and then the rhetoric stage. And so as elementary kids, they just sort of memorize the facts. Right. They don't really know what they mean. They don't know what any of it is yet. They don't have to. They're just memorizing the facts. And then they get in and they start to learn a little bit more about what that is and what it means. And then eventually they're able to debate it and actually go in and argue on behalf of or against. And I think as coaches, we can't really understand the overarching philosophy of sort of everything that we're supposed to know from programming without really understanding the grammar phase or getting the grammar phase first. You have to understand the basic like linear progression and the main lifts and how they work and sort of how you've got to get some of that first. There's no way to truly have like the same thing with math. You would never try to conquer, understand Newtonian versions of math or physics without learning first what addition and subtraction and multiplication and division are. Like you've got to have these sort of basic rules first. And then later you come behind and go, oh, I see why that's all put together that way. Right. And so the first thing that you did, primary thing that you did in the article and in the discussion with Sully was you actually sort of also redefined fitness attributes and you came in and said, well, what are we actually trying to accomplish? So again, I don't think you said this specifically in the article, but I know the way you and Sully coach and certainly the way we do at Barbell Logic, this overarching theme is how do we improve quality of life? Right. And then the next thing is, well, like, what are the steps or what are the fitness attributes that we could say, if these things are improved, that we got a pretty good clue that quality of life has improved, right? And what I like about it is it's also sort of a rethinking. I am very much wired to have a reformation style of thinking process. I come up with nothing new on my own, right? Like I've never invented anything in my life. Right. Neither have I. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But well, and in the strength world, how much is there to actually invent? It's a pretty old technology, right? That's right. So that's there's right. one bar and then we load it with things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, we call this sort of a, a rethinking or reexamining, you know, CrossFit, I think, took from the guy that invented Dynamax, the 10 physical attributes that you hear about in CrossFit all the time. They have these 10 attributes people who are very into CrossFit and very into that world do that. I kind of want to read what you came up with for those. Yeah, I think it's great. So will you take us, do you have that in front of you, Noah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. So will you walk through some of those fitness attributes? So rather than 10, you came up with nine. Yeah. And I would really agree with all those. I combined two of them for us and we have eight, but it's really the exact same nine. So what are those physical attributes? Yeah. And I will say really quick that there's a lot of overlap in some of these, which is why people end up having different ones. I think Sully has six. Right. And he's comfortable with that. Yep. But uh, so the first one I put on here is strength for all the reasons. Right. Endurance is next. Power is after that. Yep. Now, power is derivative yep. of strength yep. and speed. Yep. Right. Strength and time. But I do feel like it's the one derivative attribute that I left in the list because it's kind of athleticism yep. as well, you know, which is a little bit different than just strength or speed. Yeah. I actually call this on ours. I call it power slash speed. Yeah. But I agree. They're both derivatives of strength, but it's strength with a thing, right? So really what you're talking about often in power and speed is you're talking about training the time element, right? Because we're doing the force production element when we do number one strength. Right. And so one of the things I like about this, like number two endurance, we have to be honest about it. Strength actually doesn't train endurance for most people enough in the long term. This was one of the main points that I wanted to make with this article, too, is I think that when you get so focused on strength training because it's such an effective modality, a lot of people forget about conditioning, Yep. you know, and the importance of conditioning. And I know that for a long time, I would tell clients, 
that, you know, during this novice phase of training, when you're getting used to all of these things, don't do anything else when you're not in the gym, like riding bikes or jogging or whatever. And we can add that in later once you're strong. And that's all true. And the novelty of such a stressful training program like strength training can be will provide you with some conditioning, right, to start with. And then eventually you probably need to more deliberately approach your conditioning. But I've found that I add conditioning in a lot sooner now. Again, not because maybe they necessarily need it to have that much better of a quality of life, but because a lot of those people have different goals. You know, they don't want to just put 85 pounds on their squat. They want to be able to run, yep. let's say, or be able to ride their bike or whatever. Yep. You know, as a coach that's being paid by that person for their interests, you've got to make sure that you're checking all those boxes. Yep. Yeah, these are really like working through the first three so far. Those are three metrics that someone who cares about quality of life in a physical way are going to really want to see changed. Yes. The more of them incorporate that too. But power, I think if you get a new client who engages in another sport, like while it is a derivative of strength, they're going to want to see a measurable improvement in their power. Mm. Yep. And I think this is a good point to make too. If you have an athlete that's coming to you, Nikki, you're right. You know, let's say power would be the attribute that they're going to register the most value from. And if that's the case, we need to make sure that that metric is sort of prioritized in their training, which might make their programming look slightly different than someone else's who, you know, again, if I have an 85 year old grandmother, she doesn't really care about how athletically powerful she is. She cares about some of the other things on that list. Yep. And even if she doesn't, you know, think about it on her own all the time, I'll revisit that and make sure that, you know, those other attributes are improving in some visible way. Again, because if those are improving and those are the goals of that person, that's how you get buy-in from a client. That's right. That's how a client sticks around. It's their quality. I've had clients when I was just starting out, I've had clients that I could say, you know, you've increased your deadlift by 150 pounds. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> but they're still a little fat, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And the whole reason why they came in in the first place is because they were a little fat. Yeah. And that person kind of doesn't stick yeah. around forever, you know? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they didn't feel heard. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, it's imperative to understand that strength really is the most important of these attributes. It's the one that carries over the best, but it isn't the only thing. It isn't the only thing. There are other things. I think of it as more of a primary tool yes. in our toolbox to achieve a lot of these other goals, but it's not the goal as a standalone by itself. That's right. Unless it is. Unless somebody specifically wants to pursue it, which is Unless fine. someone's a shot putter, yeah, and they say, I need my arms and legs to be bigger. Right. You right. Know? <laughs> That's all I care about. <laughs> so number four? So number four is mobility or flexibility. Yep. I usually just say flexibility. Either one is fine. They're, for all intents and purposes, it's basically the same thing. Yeah. So it's full range of motion, right? It's the ability to go through a full range of motion for, again, whatever your life requires is a big piece of that, right? Right. So certainly the mobility or flexibility needed to be a gymnast would be very high. Probably to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu right. is significantly higher than what I need, right? I know because every time that I go and play around at a martial arts studio, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I get put in an arm bar real easy because the arm doesn't <laughs> bend very far. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, tap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A fast tap. Basically like a mummy. <laughs> and so, but yes, again, another one that's good. What next? Agility or coordination. You know, I put two names in a lot of these because I hadn't come up with the perfect term that I was really happy with. Yep. I do the same thing. On this one, by the way, I also added, this might be the one that I'd combine with the next one. I call this agility, coordination, body awareness, and balance. And while I certainly know that balance and agility are not exactly the same thing, for most of our general population, as these things improve, they sort of have it as one improves, all improves for a lot of this stuff. They are very similar. I think that the reason why I separated them is because so agility and coordination is more of a speed component to that. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's like your ability to put yourself in a specific location quickly. Right. Right. So this is probably my exposure to training so many masters, but I think about balance and I think about an older, frail person 
that is coming to the gym to improve their lives, they need to not slip on ice and shatter a bone. So agility is the way that they do that, right? Yes. Agility is the fast ability to adjust your balance. Yes. So there's a speed component to agility, whereas body awareness is more, you know, let's say they're not moving at the beginning of the deadlift, but do they know where their hips are? You know, mm. do they know if their back is rounded or not? And there's not a speed component to that per se, even though those are sort of all related in how we use them functionally in life. So that's the only reason why I separated them. But, you know, I would agree with adding them together. You could totally do that. Yeah. So, and then you started to touch on that last one, the last of the true physical pieces. Can I want to almost separate out the final three is that precision and body awareness. Why include precision there? What's your thought process for the word precision? So I think without exception, I have found that every person I've ever trained has a skewed perception of body awareness. They have a skewed perception of where their body is in space to differing degrees. Some people it's, you know, very wildly inaccurate. And then other people's, it's pretty close. It's like they had no idea that they had a butt. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of guys, right? You tell them like, turn your pelvis this way. And they're, high they're like, am I doing it? <laughs> you know, they yep. have no idea, right? <laughs> yep. They just know they have a chest. <laughs> but more than that, you know, there's a lot of people that they'll bench press or squat or whatever. And one of the sides of the bar will sort of slump, right? Or mm -hmm. like when they're pressing, almost everybody, I think, one of their arms lags a little bit with a heavy bench or press. Yeah. And they don't know that. They think that the bar is level, but it's not. And so I think as we get older, even as we form as kids, we don't have a perfect perception of reality of what's going on. And so you can get better at that though, right? A big one too. So for precision, a big one is I think a lot of people when they start weightlifting don't really have that refined of a sense of balance on their feet, let's say, you know, yeah. and you have to tell them, you know, make sure that the same amount of pressure is being felt on the balls of your feet and your toes as you feel on your heels. And a lot of people instantly improve when you just draw their attention to it, but they haven't been thinking about that. Right. You know, a lot of the times I would have clients, I'll tell them that and they say, oh, I've really been squatting on my toes, like really yeah. squatting on my toes. And I say, yeah, that's why it's so hard. They just don't think about that on a daily basis. They think I haven't fallen over and so I'm in balance. Yeah. And that's not really true. So as you add more and more weight to the bar, less and less of a deviation in that becomes more apparent to you. And I think people can sort of get attuned. You know, they can refine their ability to sense balance and where those body parts are. For sure. So that's why I made it a separate attribute there. Well, that's great. So in those first six that you just discussed, again, strength, endurance, power, mobility and flexibility, agility and coordination, and precision and body awareness, those six encompass the 10 that CrossFit or Dynamax included. Yeah. It gets really interesting here for me for the next three, which I could not agree more with, especially when we come back to the overarching why of being to improve the quality of life. So what is number seven? Seven's a big one, which I don't know why this has been left off of so many lists for so long. Maybe because, again, most of those lists were designed for athletes, you know, competitive athletes. Right. Didn't have to worry about this as much. Right. So seven is body composition. How important is that to normal people? Like often number one. Like I said, the reason why they come. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, body composition is huge. And again, obviously, we have to be careful about using words like health, unless you're solely in your doctor, then yeah, I guess you can use that. But if we just use logical and we just think about sort of middle of the bell curve and think about people in the aggregate, there is a healthy body composition yeah. spot and there are unhealthy body. And there's certainly it's not a super fine line. You know, you often hear things about like with guys, you'll hear like that the waist measurement at 40 inches. If it's over 40 inches, you're going to die of heart disease. If it's under 40 inches, you're perfectly safe. Like, obviously, it's not. And if your body composition is over 12%, yeah. you're not working hard. Enough. Right, or whatever that is, right? <laughs> right. Thank you, men's health. <laughs> There's obviously a pretty big gradient there. But for the vast majority of people, body composition is extremely important. And it's been, you know, again, I've talked about this a lot over the last several months on the podcast. It's been important for me lately. It wasn't important enough for me, obviously, for many years, for a long time. As a competitive lifter, I tried to gain as much weight as I could to be as strong as I could. And then one day, 
I'm retired from competitive lifting and I'm still 300 pounds and I'm eating like a 300 pound strongman. I'm not training like a 300 pound strongman anymore. And so the body composition actually continued to get worse. The body weight may have stayed at 300 pounds, but I actually lost some muscle and gained some fat and got myself in a place that, you know, certainly wasn't very healthy and my quality of life was suffering. And so for me, the best change that I've made over the past six months with Jillian and with training has been to get my body composition under control. So hit an all time low this morning, 254, by the way. Dang. Yeah. So down nice job. 51 pounds. That's amazing. But it is important. It's important. And so, yeah, to all of our clients, just about. I really think of all the attributes that I listed here. I also think of them as each one of these might be the metric of choice for that client. Mm -hmm. Right. So someone is going to stay if they get body composition PRs, if that's the reason why they're in the gym to begin with. That's right. So you have to focus on that as a coach or you're not doing your job. That's right. And it comes back to that old adage to give them a little what they want and give them a lot of what they need, right? So we don't just focus on body composition and not focus on strength or some of these other things. We still focus collectively, really almost always on all of them to some degree. Right. But we make sure that we communicate and that we hear them and validate what their goals are. Like if their goals are really about body composition or if their goal is to run a 5K in the endurance or a half marathon or whatever, like we've got to be able to communicate that back to them. We hear you. It's important to us as well. And we're going to work towards improving that consistently. Right. Number eight. So the next one is lack of debilitating pain. I wish I had a better <laughs> way of writing that. <laughs> but here's what I said. I said pain free and anti fragile. OK, which I think is part of this deal. Right. So one of the things you're training for is that, well, you tell us, why did you pick lack of debilitating pain outside of the obvious portion of we don't want to have debilitating pain? <laughs> uh, but I like that. I like how you put that being more durable, right, more uh, more resilient to setbacks. I picked lack of debilitating pain again because that's the metric for some people. Yes, they will know for sure that they are improving in life with these weird, hard things that we make them do if they're not in as much pain as they were before they started. Yes. And vice versa. You know, I mean, you can drill someone to the ground and they might have an aha moment one morning when they wake up. Why am I paying someone to torture me? You know, I feel awful all the time. So you have to be careful of that, too. Yes. But yeah, I think a lot of people end up having in this age of sedentariness, it's really easy for a lot of people to have chronic lower back pain yes. from sitting in chairs for, you know, yep. dozens of hours, right? We just had an article come out about that, didn't we? Yep. About sedentariness. Yep. It was really excellent. Yep. And it makes a good point too, right? That you can be physically active. And I know this is kind of off topic, but I love the point that was made in that article that you can be physically active and sedentary. Yes. It's not like, lifting a couple times a week for 90 minutes all of a sudden just negates that's right all the sitting around couch potato stuff that you do the rest of your life that's not how that works that's right yeah i was talking to rachel about this last night i feel terrible when i am sedentary so yesterday we're recording this on july 6th yesterday was july 5th my head of hr which is here on the call with us <laughs> she <laughs> demanded basically that the staff not work which is good i need to hear that right because otherwise i'll work it was hard, by the way. I love Monday mornings. I got up on Monday morning. I was like, I just want to work. I want to work. And then I didn't. <laughs> but well, I didn't work on Barbell Logic work. You didn't work publicly. <laughs> so I went out and reorganized my garage. And I felt great doing it. It was hard. And I was sweaty. And it was. But what I've noticed is now I like to enjoy some rest time. I like to go out to the pool with my family. I like to watch a movie at night with my family. But if what I do during the day is to binge on Netflix, even on a day off, I never feel better at the end of that day. And by the way, I'm not judging other people that do that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I feel far better if I go do some manual labor somewhere, you know, out at the cabin or in my garage or accomplish something. Like I feel the need to accomplish something. And it's not because I'm a workaholic. It's just, I enjoy it. I enjoy that stuff. And so it, it helps keep me from being sedentary, especially when your primary job, like we do, is sitting at a computer all day on an online business. So that lack of debilitating pain is important. And the reason I included the anti-fragile piece, or like you said, the resiliency, is our experience with our clients is that they often come into training with debilitating pain. And after several months, sometimes six months, the debilitating pain is gone. But we want to continue to help them see that the percentage chance of them having debilitating pain again 
continues to go down. That's what that resiliency is. They're less vulnerable now to future debilitating pain. Right. Do you think that also reflects the change in mindset that we have around pain? Because like, it feels like after we're 35, like you're going to have a bad night of sleep and your neck's going to yeah. be jacked up for like two weeks. But like it changes it from, oh, I can't do anything. My life is the worst. Like my neck hurts to like, oh, my neck hurts. I'm going to change some things around and yep. still be OK today. <laughs> do you think that reflects that as well? When someone is dealing with some kind of chronic pain, I think that training is sort of one half of that solution and mindset and management is the other half of it. Like you said, right? Knowing that you're going to have pains in your body and what those pains mean. So I've really been surprised the number of people that have been hurting in some way. I've told them just because you're in pain doesn't necessarily mean that there's structural damage in that part of your body. And there's always kind of a quizzical look from a lot of people like, what are you talking about? Pain means yeah. damage. Pain means hurt, you know, and it kind of doesn't. Yeah, I think that learning how to manage pain is, um, well, is a great reason to train. So those people that I've had come into the gym because they're in pain, getting them to understand that lifting can be a really powerful tool to not be at the mercy of the universe when you're having a bad day, that you're actually in control of your life, even if you're in pain. I think that that more constructive outlook on life is the most valuable thing they probably get out of lifting and realize that the better I get at lifting, the more in charge I'm going to be of my existence for the rest of time, no matter what happens. Yeah. Which leads right into the next one. Huh? Yes. Perfect lead in <laughs> for the last one. Yeah. So the last one is mental fortitude. I have met a lot of people that every other attribute on this list will allow them to deadlift a new heavy set of five, you know, a PR, and they can't do it because the moment they start pulling on a bar that doesn't immediately respond to their efforts, they just stop and they say, well, it's not going to move, you know, and there's a big shift, I think, that happens there. That's really good. I added to that one as well. So mental fortitude, and then I also call it sort of toughness and confidence, which are all really related. And I think a lot of this is gained. One of the things we're doing in training is we gain those things. Like we gain that mental fortitude. If you've walked through the refining power of heavy squats for an extended period of time, you are tougher mentally. Almost everybody is, right? And what will happen is as you become more mentally tough, you'll also find that you become more confident mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Not arrogant, not, you know, it's one of the things I think that most people who have done this and trained say, gosh, I wish I had this when I was 15 years old, yeah. 16 years old, when life was so awkward and I had no confidence. I wish I had done this thing, not so I could like rule the school, but so I felt a little better about myself and understood who I was a little bit better. I mean, I think it teaches you a lot about who you are. You do this hard thing. It's a daily reminder of the ability of your body, you know, a daily reminder of what you're capable of. It's also, you learn a lot about yourself, like what you just said, Matt, about how you react when things go well and how when things don't go well. Mm. It's like, yes, it's great when you grind through a 10 second deadlift and it's the deadlift you always wanted. And that's hugely rewarding and it takes a lot of mental fortitude. But you also sure do learn a lot of yourself when you miss a deadlift that you always wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Or you give up. Yeah. You have that terrible first exercise and you bag the rest of the workout. Yeah. And then feel guilty three hours later. Like, how can you learn how to appreciate the context of your situation? How can you learn to communicate with your coach in a way that's productive? How can you take responsibility where it's necessary? How can you continue to refine what's more important to you over time? Yeah, I think there's a lot that's learned from engaging and programming over a long period of time. I frequently talk about being a robot on the platform where you as a consciousness are kind of looking down on this machine that's just going through a set of steps. And I think developing the ability to not react to the outcomes, like not react to the results of an effort is a really useful mental ability that not a lot of people have, you know, from the rest of their lives. I love it. I love um, it. Yeah, I'm going to try that the next time I lift is I'm going to try and create an out of body experience for myself. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that. I love the discussion there of those physical attributes that we're going to train for 
with the ultimate purpose to improve our quality of life. So let's pause on this discussion and we'll come back in the next episode and then talk more nuts and bolts then about the actual, how we take those fitness attributes and we design exercise criteria in order to meet those attributes. And then very practically what those exercises, like what we end up with when we follow those exercise criteria. So this has been really part one of re-examining the exercise criteria in Barbell Logic podcast. And I get a lot of value out of this already. Yeah, same. This gives us a great overview, that 30,000 foot view. Come back next time, should be just in a couple days probably. And we'll talk through the actual exercise selection criteria. So we'll see you again here in a couple days. Mm-hmm.